That's a that's not all. It's uh, it's always great to be speaking in Treaty One territory and on Anishinaabe lands. Um, and I say that really because I think it's something that needs to be recognized. And I deal with Indigenous people, Indigenous uh, politics, both here in Australia, New Zealand, and increasingly again in Hawaii. And it's interesting because everywhere we go, uh, increasingly you have a recognition of territory. And, and I found it kind of strange today not to have a recognition of territory. And Andrea and I will talk about that for future years. Um, but I, of course, wasn't here first thing this morning, and maybe you did. But I wrote the one for the university, and we're now on to our second revision of it. And I think it's important to recognize. What I want to talk today about is about Aboriginal participation. Aboriginal people have, by and large, not participated in Canadian electoral politics. They've, by and large, not participated in Canadian politics. Or they have done so, we've participated greatly, but not in traditional processes. We've not participated by ways of voting, we've not participated by ways of involvement in political parties. The participation that has been, has been that of nations and that of indigenous political organizations such as the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs or the Assembly of First Nations. Why has this been the case? Well, indigenous people here, of course, were colonized. We still uh, would say that we live in a colonial state. Nothing has really changed. Nations are occupied, just occupied by a much nicer colonizer. That's what much of the literature would talk about today in terms of indigenous politics. And that's the part from where people tend to vote from. So when we start to explain the lack of Aboriginal vote, I think we have to start from two basis points. One is Canadian legislation, and two is the position of nationhood. Canadian legislation ignored Aboriginal people except as a jurisdiction, a jurisdiction of the federal government until 1960. Uh, the federal government had jurisdiction over Indians or Aboriginal people and Aboriginal lands under Section 9124 of the Constitution Act. In 1960, or up until 1960, Aboriginal people could only gain the right to vote if they decided that they were no longer Indigenous people. They had to enfranchise. They had to agree, if they were status people, to leave the reserve. It became illegal for them to ever go home again if they enfranchised. Uh, they did this either by marriage or by accepting, I think, at times $15 as a lump sum payment and you could get enfranchised by getting an education, leaving for three months, leaving the country, becoming a priest, getting a medical license, uh, or becoming civilized in the eyes of the law and anyone could deem that you were civilized. So 19, before 1960 you had to be deemed that you were an Indian no longer acting in the capacity of an Indian to vote. And those are really interesting words that are spoken. An Indian no longer acting in the capacity as an Indian to vote. So you could be an Indian one day, but you were no longer an Indian because you no longer acted like an Indian. You were going to vote. You were going to take up the duties of Canadian citizenship, and not, that got you the right to vote. 1960, this changes, and it was a unilateral decision. It was never asked for, as far as I can tell, in terms of the Canadian franchise. 1960, Aboriginal people got the right to vote and unilaterally became deemed to be Canadian citizens. The vote, by and large, was rejected by Aboriginal people. There were some that went and voted almost immediately. But the Aboriginal turnout has been anywhere from zero to about 15% in most elections. 
a 0% voting in communities such as the Mohawk of the Mohawk Nation, where they absolutely rejected the right to vote. And they've gotten up to about 65% of the vote uh, in odd situations where Aboriginal people have been the candidates. Willie Littlechild, formerly of the TRC, the Treaty and uh, Reconciliation Commission, um, Treaty, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there we go, uh, looking into residential schools, uh, garnered about 65 to 70 percent of the vote coming out of Wetaskiwin or Ermiskin and the communities there when he ran under Mulroney. So Aboriginal people have tended to vote when Aboriginal candidates are there, but most communities such as Mohawk, such as Crees and Saskatchewan have tended never to vote. There are some odd cases, such as uh, Willie running in Hobima, or what was formerly known as Hobima, but people have tended not to vote other than in those odd cases. There's two schools of thought that explain Aboriginal people not voting. One is just a complete alienation from the Canadian political system, and two is this idea of nationhood that this latent nationhood, latent nationalism, explains why Aboriginal people won't vote. I did research on this probably about 15 years ago now. It's kind of shocking how long ago it is for Elections Canada before I came to the University of Manitoba. And what was interesting is that in some surveys that I ran uh, of university students, Aboriginal university students, so well-educated, we think of those as markers, those that are going to possibly vote. Uh, only about three or four percent of those people that I spoke with were actually ever intending to vote. Education has tended to have a dramatically different effect in Aboriginal communities. It has actually tended to lead to less voting than more voting. And it's tended to lead to less voting because it has emerged as, a, as an Aboriginal nationalism that has emerged because of the scholars that are in the field, such as Gerald Alford or Dyke Alford, Coulthard, and others. And this is the case in the US increasingly again. It's a case in Australia. It's a case even when you get fined not to vote. And it's the case here. So we have a school of thought that Indigenous people don't vote because of nationhood or treaty, and a school of thought that says that they don't vote because they're more alienated. Elections Canada chose to believe that it was because of alienation that Aboriginal people weren't voting. And they spent a decade trying, spending more money on Aboriginal voters than they did on any other ethnic community trying to get Aboriginal people to vote. The increase in Aboriginal vote was that it didn't actually happen. They spent time meeting in friendship centers. They had rallies to vote. They had a really interesting campaign, both on the internet and elsewhere, and nothing really happened. To me, that really suggested that the voting behavior wasn't because of alienation, it was really because of the alien, it, the alienation of the nation. It was because of this idea that they weren't Canadians. I have friends that say, I don't vote in the elections in France, so why would I vote in the elections here? I felt that way. I had never voted. So, Elections Canada really didn't fix anything. It didn't see swells in voting. But what happened is that we've actually seen a turn of events. And what's really interesting is how are we going to start to explain this turn of events. And the turn of events really happened under the Harper years. The last, Harper, the last election prior to this, you saw a bit of a swing to vote. You saw more Aboriginal people getting out to vote. Really, 
not being, being alienated from the system, but being so engaged in how bad Harper was for Aboriginal people in this country. This last election, we saw a rise of about 275%, according to some pollsters, 270%. We saw a rise of 75% in most communities. And we saw people coming to the polls that had never and had gone on record as would never vote, myself among them. It's really interesting as to how we're going to begin to explain this, and I think it's really quite easy to explain. What we saw prior to the election is leadership from communities, leadership from people like Idle No More, leadership from the Indigenous Nationhood movement of Coulthard and Simpson and Simpson and Alfred, start to talk about voting in defense of nationhood so that we could no longer ignore the fact that Canada was going to run roughshod over communities and that we actually had to vote not, not vote in defense of our treaties and not vote in defense of nationhood, but we had to actually vote in defense of nationhood. And so I think that the idea of alienation of nation still holds despite the fact that we've seen a swell of 270%, 275% in Aboriginal people voting. And those numbers, I have to say, I'll speak of in just a moment, are quite curious to me. But I think that there's three real big trajectory or factors that lead to the trajectory of Aboriginal people voting. And they are Harper, uh, and I think that uh, what was said about a political threat environment is really ex an explanation, an excellent way of explaining Harper for Aboriginal people. Uh, the movement of Idle No More, or the Indigenous Nationhood movement. And then the discourse that emerged out of organizations such as the AFN and others about voting in defense of nation, in defense of treaty, and in defense of self. I want to just talk a bit about the numbers. And I've always, I'm not a quantitative person, I've always kind of hated study of election and electoral reform because I do not study it in a quantitative way. But I think the numbers are really interesting, and they're interesting for me in a methodological way. Elections Canada once put out, after one of their big campaigns, that 84% of Aboriginal people voted in one community. And the community was a small community in Saskatchewan. And what was interesting is that community was actually not uh, the polling station on that community was not simply allowing Aboriginal people to vote, community members to vote, but it was the polling station for the entire rural community. So numbers of Aboriginal people voting was actually a misnomer because they were counting non-Aboriginal people that were voting in that community. Akwasasne, another example, Mohawk community that has always talked about very proudly of having no people vote except for one in their history. And he got his house burnt down for voting in a Canadian election. This was post-1960. Akwasasne is noted by Elections Canada to have a quite interesting or quite big voting population not the zero that the community is so proud of. And that number has to account for the non-Aboriginal people that are married into Akwesasne, and for the non-Aboriginal people that are, are surrounding Akwesasne that have Akwesasne as their voting station. They share a voting station. I think the numbers are really interesting and the methodology is we have to, when we look at Aboriginal voting, uh, stats, we actually have to look at that 
as a real methodological issue. Because how do you count to Aboriginal voters when we do not count people by race or ethnicity when they go to the polling stations? And how do we count them? Well, we've tended to count those polling stations on reserve, and those polling stations on reserve are not necessarily only Aboriginal people. I want to move ahead and not talk solely about the negative. I think that we're in a time talking about electoral reform that gives me a lot of hope. And I'm reminded yesterday, I was talking to a former student, and I was laughing because I say I don't do elections and I don't work in this field, and he laughed at me and said, you've published three articles on Aboriginal electoral reform. Perhaps you have something to talk about. I've written the studies for Elections Canada. Perhaps I do have something to talk about. And it's that electoral reform that maybe will get me more interested in this field again. And as we move to discussions of electoral reform, I really would like to not just talk about Australia and New Zealand as examples of PR or, or mixed proportional. I think that we have to actually look at New Zealand not because of their electoral system for non-Indigenous people, but we have to look at the way in which New Zealand has historically and today deals with Indigenous voters. Indigenous voters have a choice in New Zealand. Māori have a choice whether to vote on a general electoral list or to vote as Māori. They have a choice to be counted as members of a nation or to be counted as citizens of New Zealand. And I think that that is a very significant thing that could maybe bring Indigenous people to the table. I wrote a thesis years ago about that the way to get Aboriginal people to vote would be to actually deal with issues of guaranteed representation and guaranteeing that treaties were represented, so treaty nations having electoral representation. And the Māori really have done that. The Treaty of Waitangi, signed just years before my treaty in 1876, deals with issues and recognizes uh, the continued sovereignty to Ringatanga of the Māori nation. They recognize in British law the continued sovereignty of Māoridom. It's a treaty that is very similar in the way in which we approach treaties as Indigenous people here. Treaty 1 did not cede the sovereignty of the Anishinaabe nation here. Anishinaabe people continue to talk about their sovereignty as recognized in Treaty 1. I come from Treaty 6. We had a bit of a skirmish in 1885 really surrounding the whole issue of the sovereignty, continued sovereignty, of Cree people in what is now South Central Saskatchewan to North Central Saskatchewan and into Alberta. That skirmish is really about issues of sovereignty as well as issues of how two nations are going to live together in a way which is mutually beneficial and mutually agreeable. And I think that the treaty as it's been implemented in New Zealand gives rise to a discussion of how we could possibly move forward here. And it links directly to electoral reform, and it allows for the representation of Aboriginal people as nations. And as nations having, or as a nation comprised of multiple iwis or tribes of Māori, there are four Māori seats moving possibly to eight Māori seats. There's a discussion now, once again, to reopen the Constitution and look at increasing Māori seats. And it has allowed two major Māori parties to exist. They become part of coalition governments. We've had Māori as Minister of Māori Affairs. And we've had a very different look the last 20 years, really the last 15 years, in New Zealand and New Zealand politics.
and the whole turn of events and the whole basis of governance and life based upon treaty has meant a complete turnaround in New Zealand's economy. Recognizing that there are two nations that the certainty of title, the certainty of land, the certainty of economy is dependent upon those two nations working together. That the political life of a nation is dependent upon those two nations working together has really meant a complete turnaround in New Zealand as a, as a, within the world economy as well as the place that most people want to go. When you think of New Zealand today, most people think of a very culturally different place because of the place of Māoridom, but also a very politically different place because of the place of Māoridom. That and, of course, The Hobbit. Thank you. I think that that holds true for Aboriginal people. Mm. Um, this past election, as well as the election before, party sold hope hope away from Harper and I think that we've never been, I think that apathy has never fit. Voter apathy, yes, but apathy has never fit the to Indigenous people. Indigenous people are, in my mind, the most political people that there are. We, kitchen tables, I write about kitchen table politics, you cannot walk into a house on res anywhere or res in the States, uh, anywhere in the world where I have walked in and there isn't a discussion of politics. There's a knowledgeable discussion. I walk into communities in Northern Australia uh, that do not have any services whatsoever and went to a consultation there about the Constitution and here were people that were walking in without shoes that looked like they just came right off the land, could have been 30, 40, 50, 80 years ago. Time was kind of irrelevant. And they had a knowledge about the Canadian Constitution. They had a knowledge about South Africa and how South Africa, the Constitution was built and what it was working and whether it was working for, for black people or black fellows like they see themselves. And it was absolutely insane, the level of knowledge that, com that community people have. And I see that every day, wherever I go. Apathy, I don't know more, I don't know more, was so misappropriately named. We have never been an idle people. We've only been idle in terms of with Canadian citizens. And Canadian citizens have been idle when it comes to Indigenous issues. And I think that apathy is what we have tried to deal with in this past election, is to try and get Canadians less apathetic about Indigenous people. And so voter apathy hasn't been about dealing with Indigenous voter apathy, but it's been dealing with non-Indigenous voter apathy mm -hmm. in terms of Indigenous issues and voting for Indigenous issues. The stigma about voting or non-voting is still there in Aboriginal community. We have the chief of the AFN who came out very publicly and said, we have to vote. And then he turned around and said that he would not vote because he had never voted and nor would he ever vote. He did go and vote. Uh, but many, many people spent a lot of time thinking and, and really getting to deep emotional issues as to whether they would vote. I thought and thought and thought about it. The last election, I thought, or the past, the, previous, the one previous to this, I even went, drove myself to a polling station and thought, I have to get in there. You know, votes matter. I'm a political scientist. I know this. I've read the literature. We should vote. I couldn't do it. This past election, I voted prior to election day. At, is simply because I thought on election day I'm not going to stand in line, there's no way I will do this, I will talk myself out of this. And I voted the one time, and I don't think I will ever vote again in Canadian elections, unless something radically changes. And I think that what we will see is a trend in that way. And I, I'm really curious as to whether Aboriginal youth will follow in, the foot, in those footsteps. And I think that we have seen a more radicalization of Aboriginal politics in the last 10 years under Harper
I think that the I Don't Know More movement has really shifted to an indigenous nationhood movement following the likes of Alfred and, and Korntasl and others, following some of the Hawaiian sovereignists that they work with. And so I think it's really interesting. The stigma is against voting in indigenous communities. The stigma is anti-voting. And it is, you are stigmatized if you participate in Canadian elections, mm -hmm. even when there was a huge call to vote this past election. So it's an interesting counterbalance to really what happens in Canadian society. It's interesting that you mentioned Clinton because Clinton uh, ran on a, at least mentioned in his uh, last election, uh, a need to deal with Hawaii and the illegal occupation of Hawaii. And then he went and apologized for the illegal occupation of Hawaii. And that did nothing about it. <laughs> and now Barack Obama, in the last days of his administration, is trying to actually deal with this yeah. and something that he also campaigned on. Um, but I think that's really uh, Hawaiians, or, or Hawaiians, as I would say, uh, have been a people of little hope. Uh, you have a bit of hope about these politicians, but like other indigenous people, you just think that it's a campaign promise and it's gonna go. Um, I think that we're sitting in the same sort of seat right now uh, as uh, Hawaiians were under Obama and other people were under Obama sitting 100 days in and thinking, okay, are we in the, in the, in the really nice uh, honeymoon? Yes, I'm going, what happens after a marriage? Yes. Um, the really nice honeymoon uh, of indigenous politics. We had a, uh, the Human Rights Tribunal, uh, Human Rights Commission came up with its report this week on the underfunding of Aboriginal children in care we have underfunding of education so that uh, kids in schools in Manitoba get less than half the dollar value that kids that in public systems get. We have a, a very tragic underfunding in communities, yet we're told that we get everything for free, which we don't. Um, but, you know, it's a really going to be a very interesting next 100 days. Can Trudeau actually, will he follow through? Will he actually reinvest in Aboriginal communities? Will he actually stand up to Canadians and explain that there's a thing called a treaty and that we also have to deal with the mitigating effects of 150 to 300 years of colonization and the impact that residential schools and other things have had on families? I think that it really is questionable as to, he, as to whether he will actually do anything. I have a bit of hope. I think he really raised that idea of hope among Aboriginal people. But I think that most of us actually just are quite complacent realizing that anything is better than Harper. And, you know, he's just going to be another politician. And let's see, maybe he will be better. But I don't think there's a lot of absolute hope and absolute uh, credence as to whether he will, in fact, come through with that.